Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. My name is Jay Grignani, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute's Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members can access many great opportunities through their involvement with the Institute, including volunteering at programs and networking with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please email us at dolesab at ku.edu or speak with a student worker after the program. A video of today's program will be available on our YouTube channel. You can also access videos of past programs by visiting our YouTube channel. A loop hearing system is available to use if you have, if you have a T-coil hearing aid. We also have a limited number of listening devices. If you have questions about the loop system or if at any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. If you are a part of our virtual audience, you may submit your questions at dolequestions at ku.edu. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. Now, please join me in welcoming Director Audrey Coleman. Thanks, Jay, for that warm welcome. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here at the Dole Institute for our kickoff of our fall 2023 season. It's great to be back with you all. We had a wonderful summer celebrating our 20th anniversary and Senator Bob Dole's 100th birthday, and now we are so thrilled to have the students back here on campus, these wonderful student advisory board members, uh, who many of whom you met on the way in, and it's just uh, some, some wonderful energy. And you might recognize on the stage a familiar face, Brendan Buck was with us uh, last fall, 2022, for our post-election conference, and we're so thrilled that he's going to moderate our discussion this, after, this evening, chaos on the campaign trail inside a tumultuous race for the White House. And we're presenting this program in partnership with KU Debate and the Institute for Leadership Studies. Brendan is a partner at Seven Letter, a Washington and Boston-based public affairs agency, and he's an NBC News on-air political analyst. Brendan spent 12 years on Capitol Hill, serving as a top aide to two consecutive speakers of the House, Counselor to House Speaker Paul Ryan and as Press Secretary to House Speaker John Boehner. He also served on the 2012 Romney Ryan presidential campaign as Press Secretary to Vice Presidential nominee Paul Ryan. Brendan additionally is a formal fellow, former fellow at the Harvard Institute of Politics and as I mentioned is a returning panelist. Please help join me in welcoming back Brendan Buck. I want to make a couple of brief program announcements before I turn it over to Brendan to introduce his guests. Come back next Thursday, September 21st at 7 p.m. for a conversation with former U.S. Trade Representative Bob Lighthizer. He's going to discuss his book, No Trade is Free, Changing Course, Taking on China, and Helping America's Workers. That conversation will be moderated by KU Zone Professor of Political Science, Jack Zhang. Uh, for those who purchase his book in advance, there will be an opportunity for him to sign after that program. And then your September is taken care of. We have, we have it all planned out for you. We want to put something else on your calendar. September 26th, we will have our annual program in honor of Constitution Day on the evening of September 26th. Our own senior associate director, Barbara Ballard, will be moderating that conversation. And you can watch for more information uh, on our website and also on our weekly newsletter about that program, uh, which is coming up. But when is Constitution Day, everyone? When is Constitution Day proper? <laughs> September 17th. It's on Sunday, all right? I have to tell you a story. And this will embarrass uh, my, my daughter, who's 10 years old. <clears throat> but she was in third grade, and we were driving past uh, uh, an ice cream store downtown, and it was packed full of people. And she said, look at all those people. It was September 17th. She said, it, they must be here to celebrate Constitution Day. <laughs> Isn't that great? As, as much or more important than July 4th, so you'll never forget it now. I won't take any of your more, more of your time. We have some fantastic guests for you this evening. Brendan Buck, thank you so much for inviting these yeah. the wonderful uh, folks to be with us this evening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Audrey. 
Um, and thank you so much for, for having us. It's terrific to be back here. I appreciate the hospitality uh, that you've always shown. Um, just really special to be at uh, this place uh, once again. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to have two of the most uh, respected, hardworking journalists in Washington with us today, uh, tonight, to uh, dive into everything that's going on in politics. Um, when we uh, gave a title to this uh, this evening, we called it you know, Chaos on the, the Campaign Trail. I thought maybe that was a little bit overstating it, but once again, this week we learned, you know, there's always something new, so we, we've got plenty uh, to talk about. So let me introduce um, our, our, our two panelists here, and then we'll get right into the questions. We'll have a conversation, um, and then as Audrey said, I uh, want to bring you in to, to ask your, your questions as well. Um, I will start with Ali. Uh, I'm going to read some bios here. Uh, Ali Vitali is a Capitol Hill correspondent for NBC News based in Washington. Uh, Ali has reported on both President Biden and Vice President Harris throughout the 2020 campaign trail and throughout inauguration, cabinet appointments, and confirmation. Um, I do want to say that while Ali's main job is Capitol Hill correspondent, she really has two full-time jobs because she's also out on the campaign trail. I don't know when she sleeps. I don't know when she has any time for anything else. She doesn't. <laughs> um, in 2020, February of 2023, Ali sat down with former uh, Vice President Mike Pence in an exclusive broadcast interview ahead of the 2024 uh, election and has continued her coverage of the GOP field. Uh, as an NBC road warrior in 2020, Ali followed and reported on the campaigns of Elizabeth Warren, Amy Klobuchar, Michael Bloomberg. Uh, she previously covered the Trump administration as a White House reporter for NBC News Digital. Uh, and in 2022, I encourage you to check this out, Ali authored Electable, Why America Hasn't Put a Woman in the White House Yet, uh, a book detailing her experiences as a road warrior and investigating the double standards placed on female presidential candidates. Sungmin Kim is a White House reporter for the Associated Press, specializing in the nexus of the Biden administration and Capitol Hill. Uh, before joining the AP in July 2022, she had the same beat at the Washington Post, where she led the publication's coverage on President Biden's legislative agenda, Donald Trump's relationships and battles with Congress, which I know a little bit about, uh, <laughs> and three Supreme Court confirmation fights. She has also served as a political analyst for CNN uh, since 2018. Sungman's first major reporting role in Washington was as a congressional reporter for Politico, where she spent more than eight years and primarily covered the Senate. She's also worked at USA Today, the Star-Ledger in Newark, New Jersey, the St. Paul Pioneer Press, the St. Petersburg <laughs> Times, and the Des Moines Register, how about that? Um, Sungman is actually a native of Iowa, so we, we can always tap into uh, that experience as well. Uh, and she is currently the president of the Washington Press Club Foundation and is a longtime member of the Asian American Journalists Association. So two very impressive people, um, excited to, to get into it. We have a lot to talk about uh, as it relates to the primary and the, the campaign as it's coming up. I want to start with some more recent news that, that happened this week that I think will certainly uh, play a part of that. Uh, House of Representatives has initiated a impeachment inquiry into President Biden. Um, so let me start with you, Sungmin. Um, this is pretty historic, significant right. stuff. What is the White House thinking? What is their reaction to this? So right now their strategy has been to take what several House Republicans have said, that themselves have said about any impeachment efforts into President Biden saying there is no evidence there, there is no there there, we don't have enough yet, and kind of using those words to turn it back on Republicans. And right now in terms of, um, in terms of answering a lot of these procedural questions that often come up in an impeachment or impeachment inquiry, such as, are you going to comply with requests? Will you hand over records? They're not even starting to entertain those types of questions just, just yet. In terms of a messaging effort, they're really focused on painting this as a really just baseless, um, you know, trumped up, maybe that... Pun <laughs> definitely <laughs> intended. Definitely, it's sort of not intended, <laughs> but it kind of works up here. Um, thing that has no basis in evidence and, and no basis in facts, and they so that's kind of their strategy for now. I know I've talked to people in the White House who feel that um, this is something that if this goes on as much as, um, you know, as far into the process as it did with Clinton and obviously with President Trump's two impeachments, that it will be something that potentially 
backfires on the Republicans. You kind of see where Biden is, himself is at in, in how he treats this. He is actually um, he's actually right now finishing up a fundraiser in the suburbs of Washington as we speak. And the interesting thing about President Biden is that he gets a lot more candid in these fundraisers um, <laughs> when uh, there are no photographers and cameras are not allowed. The press is allowed in, but we're only able to take pen and pad notes. And it's that's when you can get pretty, um, pretty much, like I said, much more candid. And he actually had some comments about impeachment just now. And he said that, look, there, and he's actually said this before, but much more relevant now, but he says, look, they're only impeaching me because they're trying to like also, you know, like, like about to shut down a government too. So they're trying to really paint, you know, from President Biden on down, trying to paint Republicans as this out of control, not based in fact effort. Um, and that's gonna be their approach for at least at least the first bit here. Well, let's pick up on that. Um, obviously some potential risk here politically yeah. for Republicans going down this road. Do, are they concerned about that? Are they thinking about that? What are, what are they saying about that? Well, first of all, thank you for having us. I'm so excited to be here. Bob Dole is one of my favorite politicians, so this is a real treat, and on a school night, no less. Um, and a break from Congress, where we have spent a considerable amount of time already this year hanging out outside Speaker McCarthy's office. You know the way that this place is laid out. You stand and you wait for these people, because you know that they are going to come by, and you know you've got questions for them. I think what's striking, and the question that I will inevitably ask McCarthy is, the way that he parses this out politically, because yes, he is capitulating to some people on his right, Matt Gates, others in the Freedom Caucus, who have wanted him to move forward on impeachment for as long as he's been speaker. I talked to many of those folks yesterday after McCarthy said he was opening an impeachment inquiry, and they basically said, so? It doesn't help him in the letting the steam out the pot way that I think he might have hoped. It doesn't buy him the goodwill that he might have hoped. He's trying to buy goodwill for nothing to do with impeachment, what we were talking about at dinner, having to do with a government shutdown, and we'll get there. But the risk that you run with an impeachment inquiry, which is like half a step to an actual impeachment, they don't have the votes for an actual impeachment yet, so we're here in this middle ground. The risk you run is if you don't actually go for a full impeachment, you've basically acquitted him. And so then you've neutralized the talking point that President Biden is, in Republicans' words, corrupt or profiting off the office or doing things that are untoward or illegal. They have, and I love that you pointed this out, the idea that McCarthy came out and said, we've uncovered allegations. <laughs> I'm a daughter of two lawyers. They yeah. uncover evidence, right? Yeah. So, so that, I think, is the challenge for those of us who will be waiting outside the Speaker's office and going through all the halls of Congress asking questions about this, is there is no clear, defined answer that every Republican has coalesced around, Biden did X, because they don't have the evidence for that. And so if they get it, of course we'll cover that, but I think that's the challenge here, is their goal is to muddy the waters and make it sound like uncovering allegations is uncovering evidence, and if yeah. they don't, then they run into a problem. Yeah, I remember in the beginning of this Congress, people would ask me, do you think they're gonna impeach him? And mm. I said, over what? Um, <laughs> And I think we're, we're, we're going to get to that. So I want to come back to the underlying issues um, that uh, are the basis for the impeachment inquiry, and we'll come back to that. But let's, let's take a step back and, and, and focus for a minute on the Republican primary uh, that, is, that is taking place. Um, so I, I, Ali, I'd love to ask you, Donald Trump, by most polls, is now leading by, by 40 points, and that really hasn't changed a whole lot in months. Um, you've been covering a number of the other campaigns. What is the scenario, or what is the case that they lay out where someone other than him is the nominee? They're all still running. What do they expect could happen to change that at this point? Do they, do they make a case for that? I think all of them make the case that Iowa is the moment to show someone other than Trump can win. And look, on paper, Trump is not, and you know this from growing up there, Trump is not an on-paper good candidate for Iowa. A lot of evangelical conservative voters there who might not attach themselves to Trump and the way that he is and acts. Certainly, he has a lot of support there, but other people like Pence, like Haley, like Tim Scott, think that they are more traditionally conservative and can appeal to these voters. I guess we'll see. I'm not sure we see it in the polls yet. The thing that they're not saying when they say that, oh, we just have to find someone who can win in Iowa, the thing they're not saying is they need to split the pie less ways. And this is what the Trump folks have always said. The bigger the field, the better it is for them. And everyone is so far playing along with that scenario because no one's dropped out other than Miami Mayor Francis Suarez. 
I know we all remember the campaign well. <laughs> but until people drop out, all of the non-Trump candidates are split in that pie. And for as long as they're doing that, I don't know that any of their theories of the case are really super viable. And, you know, polling is consistent. He's gone through four indictments. Indictments are not convictions. We'll watch that play out through the fall. But certainly you would expect that if it was going to have an impact, we would have seen some kind of an impact. So uh, I, I get the argument that Iowa is important, yet Donald Trump is still leading by a significant right. margin. Do we expect, so we're going into another debate in, in two weeks, do you expect anything different from any of these candidates? Do you try to change the trajectory? You know, I think the only way you actually see things substantively change is if these candidates realize that there is political upside to going after Trump. Conventional politics tells you, you gotta go after the person who's leading the pack. There is this real reluctance to go after him because there's a fear of alienating the MAGA base that will vote. And I take that, that's real, but if you don't go at the guy at the top and you can't say why you're running against him for real, then it's kind of hard for any voter to say, well, okay, you've, you've made that choice for me. I don't think subtlety is gonna win, having covered Trump for as long as we've covered him. <laughs> this is not a, an art of subtlety. This is you either go at the guy or you don't. So I remember back in 2016, the, the Clinton campaign seemed to be very delighted that they were running against Donald Trump. They thought he was very beatable. What is the Biden team thinking about watching this? Do, are they excited about rematch? Are they surprised that Donald Trump is so easily going to be the potentially the nominee? There are, especially earlier this year, there were definitely very senior Democrats um, that I had talked to who were like, Trump is going to be the nominee. Biden will, Biden, despite all of his um, political vulnerabilities, and we can talk about that later, will defeat Trump. He did it once before. Um, this is the race that we're looking forward to. But there are so many other, that, that sentiment is definitely not universal among Democrats, is definitely not universal at, within the White House and, and in Biden's, Biden's inner circle. But they know that the strengths that they have when Trump is the candidate is that Donald Trump is perhaps the single most single best motivator for Democrats. Democrats want to come to the polls to defeat Donald Trump. And they feel that ultimately at the end of the day, even, even if poll, head to head polls now show him even behind Trump in certain circumstances, that once there is a two person <laughs> race, once, you, once the contrast becomes more clear, um, that they can make that argument, they can motivate Democrats. Because right now, the pro one of the biggest problems for the Biden White House and for Biden's reelect is just that lack of motivation between uh, uh, by Democrats and Democratic leading voters voters for President Biden. I mean, we've done a lot of polling at the AP, and a fun part of uh, a fun part of my job is that when we do polling on you know President Biden's approval ratings or his handling of the economy or inflation or climate or all these issues, we reach out and talk to a lot of the voters who participate in the polls and ask them what. We thought, and one of the stories that I did earlier this year was just exploring this really big gap between um, even Democrats who approve of what Biden is doing and approve of his job performance, but still at the same time say they don't want him to run again. So, and you do that, and there's so many Democrats who are fine with what Biden has done, but still feel the country is going on the wrong track. They feel that he hasn't done enough. So they are going to have to find a big motivator. And with Biden, the man, being not a great motivator himself, that motivator is going to be the prospect of Trump going back to the White House. We've seen sort of floated that the candidate they were most afraid of was Nikki Haley. Is that something you have heard as well? I talked to people about that after some of that reporting came out. I think the difference in the way that Democrats are approaching sort of Trump as the candidate or like the non-Trump as the Republican candidate is that if or if and when um, Trump is the nominee, that it really turns into a, um, a turnout election. Like if, no one needs to define Trump. We all know Trump, who Trump is, and everybody has an opinion on Trump. Um, they feel that if, I don't know if they're going as far to say they're afraid of Nikki Haley, but they feel like if for some whatever reason, the Republican nominee does end up being like a Nikki Haley or Tim Scott, they feel that they have a really good opportunity to, to bind them really early and really quick to a national audience 
right now, I think it's fair to say that like the bigger national audience may not be paying attention to the Republican primary, but you are seeing efforts already on the Democratic front highlighting, you know, for example, the Republican Party's stances on abortion. And if someone not named Trump is um, it, it does become the Republican presidential nominee, then some of the Democrats I've talked to feel confident that they can really aggressively define these any of these any of these other Republican presidential candidates as extreme, especially because some of the many of them haven't been tested on the national stage. You know, Tim Scott, we know him well as a fixture on Capitol Hill, but he has never had a competitive race in South Carolina because yeah. he's just been that dominant in South Carolina Republican politics. So they're um, looking at that. But I also think it's it's hard to realistically see a nominee that's not Trump at this moment. Yeah. I think that's right. I mean, uh, here's here's the thing that I think about too is what I hear from Democrats often is this idea of, oh well, you know, the risk you run with nominating someone on the Republican side that's not Trump is that they they fear voters could think that person is normal by comparison. I hear this all the time as like one of the hand wringings from Democratic strategists. And fine, I take that point, but I think the thing that people forget is we've gone through a six or seven year period now where Trump doesn't really play by political rules. Like there's no political gravity around him. He can say things that should otherwise be career ending and just rebound like nothing happened. I mean, everything from the Access Hollywood tape through four indictments is proving that to us over and over and over again. And it's funny yeah, because yeah. you're like, it's, what? Yeah. But everyone else plays by the normal rules of politics and gravity still applies. And so I feel like as much as Democrats might hand ring and fret as they want to do over what a non-Trump Republican candidate could look like, I think that they forget that like it normalizes the political playing field again and like all of the old tricks of oppo books and what these people did on policy, all of that starts to matter again because it just never really mattered with Trump. And that's why you also, and this strategy dates back into well before the midterms last year where Democrats did surprisingly well considering the national environment and the map, but it's in the Senate, but they, they want to kind of, yes, there's Trump, the man and the brand and, or, or, and sort of that political toxicity that they want to seize on, but they also, there's a reason why the Biden White House, Biden himself says MAGA Republicans over and over. So they're making the point that it's not just Trump. It's just, it's all up and down the ticket. It's, you know, it's in the House races, it's in the Senate races, the MAGA-ness, if you will. And they found that that messaging, um, they feel that their, their internal polling and their surveys have shown that it's an effective message for them, which is why you had so much focus on, you know, up in the midterms, it was so much of a focus on these MAGA Republicans and not necessarily tr Trump Republicans. Yeah. Let's talk about somebody not named Donald Trump for just a moment. Um, <laughs> Allie, mm -hmm. Ron DeSantis, what happened? Not named Trump, but like mm -hmm. trying to be Trump. <laughs> I think that's what happened. I mean, we were talking about this a little bit over dinner too. Like, I think there were a few flaws to this and I've covered DeSantis for a while. I covered his 18 gubernatorial when he begged for Trump's endorsement and really ran in a Trump-like image with that ad of mm. you know, reading to his kid to build the wall. <laughs> um, and, and then in 2022, when he ran as an executive and a governor who clearly had eyes on a higher prize. Um, he never fixed the problems that I felt like were very evident and obvious then, which is this is not a man who looks comfortable glad-handing and talking on a rope line. And, People have certainly seized on that to try to show that he's uncomfortable. And I know that that's not what you do as president, but Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, these are retail politics states. You gotta go into the diner. You gotta talk to the person over their morning muffin. This is what it is. And he has not been able to do that. But I think more than that, it's clear that I think they sort of almost missed the moment on announcing. Like there was a clear ramp up March, April, May, and then June ultimately when he announced and I recognize that they wanted to get through a full term in the Florida legislature. All these things make sense on a calendar, but that's not necessarily the way that public attention actually works. And so I think that because he stayed out of it unofficially for so long, other people were able to seize on him. Trump was able to really put him in his sights. And I don't think he's ever really recovered from that. And I think it proves the reality that if you're a Republican voter who wants Trump, you can vote for Trump. And until these people give a true stark contrast, and I don't mean the way that Asa Hutchinson is doing it, but like a true stark contrast where you show the MAGA faithful that you are with them, but not in the way that Trump is, however you want to delineate, 
then I think that's the only way. And it can't be, well, you know, generational change, which Nikki Haley says. Like, you've got to kind of go at this person because that's the only way that you prove. And so for DeSantis, I think, you know, it was a lot of ramp up and then there was just so much expectation built that I've not met a voter that's like, this is exactly the guy I thought he was when, you know, yeah. he was the white knight that was going to be the next Trump. Let me ask about it in a different way. And if, if it's okay, we'll get a little nerdy in campaign operations. Something also unique about the DeSantis operation is how they've set themselves up, yeah, effectively right. having most of their campaign run by a super PAC. Um, I'm curious you, your sort of just you know, your take on that. And you know, this is we've been moving in this direction for a little while. Jeb Bush did something sort of similar. I was on the Romney campaign, yeah. and I can't fathom the idea that our chief strategists would be in another building that you couldn't talk to them. Yep. Yeah. Do you think that there's been sort of a, a reassessment of this sort of way to do things? Um, are we going to continue to see this working this way? There's a lot of reassessing, I think, <laughs> happening right now, as we've reported. I mean, I'm not saying anything out of turn. I, I think this is what it is now because of the way that you can move money and buy ads and move people. And I think all of that makes sense. Super PACs are becoming that much more powerful. It's so striking to me to watch a candidate get on a super PAC campaign bus and still have all of us maintain the veil that these are separate entities that legally can't talk to each other. I mean, okay, they're not, I'm not saying they're doing anything illegal, but it's, it's just really a flaunting of the system. The downside to it, if you're not paying for your bus events through Iowa and New Hampshire and whatever, the downside to it is that you are not, your conversations at the campaign are still one step removed, however removed it is, from the outside organization that's still doing the bulk of the door knocking, the bulk of the ad buying. And I do think that having never been a candidate, I don't know, I would want my stuff in house. I mean, you, you can probably speak to this too, but I think that's gonna be one of the lessons of the DeSantis campaign is how helpful is it to decentralize? Right, especially with the reputation that Ron DeSantis has of having a very, very close inner circle, his Correct. wife being his closest political advisor. It's just a really like, fascinating setup. I think we're going to be examining the repercussions of that for a long time. Uh, changing gears a bit, um, the leading Republican candidate is facing 91 indictments. Um, and yet, that hasn't been a problem. Ali, just quickly, why hasn't that stuck in any meaningful way? I think it's the political gravity stuff again, right? I, I mean, it's both completely stunning and also not shocking at all. And I do come at this from the perspective that Trump was the first campaign I ever covered. I remember sitting at Trump Tower after the Access Hollywood tape. People who I had known the entire campaign were calling me being like, oh, I know that I'm so loyal to him, but he is done. How do you survive that? Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, there were people in the RNC, you know this, yeah. we all know this, that were trying to figure out how do you get Trump off the ballot and make Mike Pence the top of the ticket. Right. But the rules do not apply. And in part, the Access Hollywood stuff can be chalked up to gender and the things that we allow men versus women to say, and I can get into that if you want, but because <laughs> that's my bread and butter. But I do think with Trump, it's so baked in the cake. Yeah. It's so baked, the people who love him say that everything against him couldn't possibly be real or true, and if it is, they don't care. And the people who hate him, they hate him anyway. And, and, and obviously, a lot of the Republican candidates haven't really gone after him on them, but. Also, the White House has made, I think, a strategic decision right. to not engage a lot on, on these indictments. Can you talk a little bit about how the White House is seeing this and, and their strategy on, on navigating the politics of it? Right. They, any, if anything involving criminal investigations into Donald Trump, especially as it pertains to the Justice Department, part of the federal government, they just do not want to be like anywhere near that with a 10-foot pole. A lot of it is that you hear um, accusations without evidence from Republicans, Republican candidates, that this is Biden's prosecutor using the weight of the federal government to try to put his political opponents in prison. They knew that they knew that line was going to be out there. I'm sure this was a part of Merrick Garland's thinking to to taking those investigations outside and giving it to a special counsel, but yet those th that notion was always was going to persist and i think the white house knew that which is why it's another reason 
why they want to stay as far away as possible. Emphasize that you know, you know, when it when an indictment happens, particularly with the two DOJ related indictments, they say we found out. You know, the president found this out on TV, just as everyone else did. And they really, um, so much of his brand during the 2020 election and what they really tried to do at the start of his presidency was to restore sort of this normalcy competence in the federal government after four chaotic years. And I think they felt that voters just really needed that respite from the insanity of Washington. A lot of that was trying to restore this faith in the institutions, this faith in the notion that the Justice Department isn't you know, the president's personal lawyer like President Trump liked to view the Justice Department as. And that was a really important part personally for, for Biden. And obviously, that dictates White House strategy, and that dictates the Democratic National Committee strategy as well. I've thought for a while that because, you know, for example, like um, the classified documents investigation at Mar-a-Lago, obviously, that's not, that's something that Biden wants to stay away from for those reasons I also mentioned, but also the fact that he has his own special counsel investigation into his his um, alleged mishandling of classified forget. documents. Yeah, that investigation is quiet for a while. I had to like refresh my memory that that was a you thing. You said it, and I was like, oh yeah, that that is still a thing. Um, but it's it, it it was it's going to be interesting to me how they handle the, if they ever engage, and I don't think they will, knowing them. But if they do ever engage on the issues of his behavior and his culpability related to the election um, related crimes and, and the January 6th um, uh, uh, charges as well, because that was also so much of a focus of his campaign, restoring democracy, like restoring faith in democracy. Um, so it, that's also going to be a, an interesting kind of challenge for the White House to see how they, if they ever kind of really take that issue head on, because that issue is so important to but, this president. But like, how do you be battle for the soul of a nation and also not talk about what some experts have called a, an attempted coup. How yeah. do you not talk about that? It's the central... Central to his story and also one of the biggest vulnerabilities of your right. opponent. I mean, Correct, at some right. point, I, I feel like at some point it's got to change. And you hear from Democrats, well, they'll allow surrogates to talk about it. At right. some point, I, I, it's hard. I have to think at some point it changes where the president himself, the candidate, right. has to be willing to take that on. Um, Something else they're sort of loathe to talk about, but I think we, we do need to talk about, um, is the, the issues surrounding the president's son. Um, and obviously, it's been reported that he is potentially himself going to be uh, indicted later this month. How worried is the White House about all of the noise surrounding uh, his son uh, and, and any sort of fallout that, that is to come? Well, I think in terms of the actual impact, I mean, we thought, we thought, and I'm sure the White House thought that his, the criminal issues surrounding his son Hunter was on its way to kind of winding down. He was able, he was ready to kind of enter this plea in federal court in Delaware before it kind of spectacularly collapsed before our eyes. And is, he's kind of going through this whole criminal process and this issue again. So the more that the issue of Hunter um, you know, because it stays as a live issue. So, you know, you have like the plea entering, you have the hearings, you have the eventual, however the case is disposed. Whenever that's in the headlines, it is not something that is good for the president, it's something that is not good for the White House. <laughs> Um, with any sort of investigation, and this is kind of a point that applies to the impeachment investigations, however, for however far that may actually progress, but any sort of kind of investigation, the, the, the one kind of X factor in that for Biden is that you never know what an investigation is going to lead to. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was the Benghazi investigation that led to the discovery of Hillary Clinton's yep. classified, or the, the email server with the, on the issue with her email. Yeah, so and once Penn you Star have- wasn't about Lewinsky. Right, yeah. and like, so once an investigation starts, like you just never know where it's going to lead, especially someone, especially with like a special counsel or with a separate criminal investigation. And that's, they just don't know. And I would imagine that's a very scary part for the White House. Do you feel like the president has something of a blind spot on this issue because it is his son? I think so. I think there is a very, very, and understandably so. I mean, there is a very, very small circle of White House advisors, Biden advisors, who can talk to the president about his son, which is obvious, <laughs> and his son being an obvious 
not daily, but a regular topic in the news and the public conversation that has to be broached with the with the president of the United States. But I mean, this is on the one sense, this is, you know, it, it is a family issue. It is a really personal, hard issue for the Biden family. And and I, so I think there is a big sensitivity and challenge of dealing with that with someone who clearly had personal issues that he has been very open about <coughs> and has and has talked about and and kind of trying to figure out how you you know seeing that he's being used as a political weapon against them and how you combat that but i do think the interesting thing about president biden is that um, and whether you think it was smart or not, like when Hunter Biden's in the news, like he's not afraid to like make him part of the, you know, part of the family and part of events. I think the same week that um, the plea deal was coming together, um, he was spotted having fun at the White House state dinner. Um, yeah. uh, and, and, and they really do make an effort to show that th he is part of the family. And like this, it, it's a very, very just hard, tricky situation for kind of the people around him to deal with. And Republicans have to love that the, he's at the White House. I, I, we've danced, danced around it a little bit. Can you, Allie, just maybe just for a second, like what is it that Republicans are sort of alleging or what is it they're <laughs> trying to prove as it relates to Hunter Biden? There's a few pieces to it. I mean, one of the things that has been debunked is the idea that Biden withheld aid to Ukraine to get rid of a, pro a prosecutor there. The Biden administration, when he was vice president, explained that prosecutor was corrupt. That's why they withheld the aid. It had nothing to do with the Hunter Biden connection that Republicans often try to make with the company Burisma that he was working with. The thing that they will continuously try to allege and what they have had, depending on who you ask, varying degrees of success at trying to make something stick here is the idea that in Hunter's business dealings and in Biden's brother's business dealings, they were profiting under the table by saying that they had connections with the guy in the White House, in the vice presidency, and that Biden was somehow involved and also profiting off of that. That's the allegation that they have uncovered. It is not the evidence that they have uncovered. Even in the instance, if I can go a layer deeper, when they have had Hunter Biden's old business partner, Devin right. Archer, come before the various committees, he has said that there were conversations that were had between Biden and some of the business associates, but that they were pleasantries, right? So allegation, not evidence. And I think for those of us who are covering this on Capitol Hill, what's, what becomes difficult, I think, is that when you start throwing around the word investigation, it's really easy for casual viewers and sometimes non-casual viewers of this to find that it gets all jumbled up into the same ball of yarn. And I think that's what Republicans in the Trump campaign are absolutely fine with happening because all you need is the idea of investigation to stick to both sides to make it seem like these guys aren't that different. And I do think again, and maybe I'm you know, a little bit like of a purist about this, but I think January 6th to me is just such a seminal moment that cannot be equivocated. Um, that the idea that they're not going to talk about it, I think it does become untenable. Um, because you walk around the Capitol every single day and like this is still a palpable right. way that Democrats and Republicans relate to each other or rather can't because one party felt that they could question a legitimate election and the other party, you know, suffered an insurrection for it. So it looks like we're heading to a, a rematch. Um, <laughs> But before we, before we sort of assume that, I, I do want to just talk a little bit about, I think, some of the angst that, whether it's Hunter Biden or the president's age, there feels like there is a bit of angst among some Democrats that Donald Trump, or excuse me, that Joe Biden may not be the strongest candidate. Um, there was a, a, a column this morning from David Ignatius in the Washington Post, longtime writer. Uh, I would classify, classify him as sort of liberal elite, um, saying Joe Biden should <laughs> step aside. Um, how much is that a real thing that they're worried about? Not necessarily that, that, that column, but the idea that there are a lot of Democrats who are just not very excited about Joe Biden and whether that ends up being a, a problem, particularly with a number of demographic groups right. that have been so important to uh, the Democratic coalition to win elections recently. So that is certainly a serious problem. Um, there, if you look at the... 
I, 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 I'm going to botch the numbers, but when we did the um, when we did approval of Biden's handling on the economy among Democrats, it was it was like shockingly low. And when you can when you can't even convince a significant part of your own party to think that you are doing a good job on the seminal issue, the, the significant issue that voters care about year after year, then that is a big problem which is why for now they are trying not to really be in full on campaign mode. The extent of President Biden's like reelection activities are um, raising money. Um, they have pointed to sort of the, they keep pointing to kind of sort of the Barack Obama reelection calendar. So in terms of really ramping up actual campaign events, it's not gonna be until next year. And they feel that they, they can spend this, the, this year sort of kind of not only raising money, but trying to continue to promote his accomplishments. And then, you know, once the Republican nominee is clear, <laughs> then really kind of seize on the whole contrast issue that we were talking about earlier. I mean, it's not, you know, Biden's strategy is pretty easy and he kind of says it out loud all the time that, you know, it, you know, my daddy, you always used to say, Joey, you know, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. <laughs> the alternative. And as you know, and that is actually really his strategy. And to a certain extent, it worked in a midterms where midterms are traditionally a referendum on the party in power. They did significantly Democrats uh, from Biden on down or, or, or you know, a strategy that was led kind of primarily by the White House and by the DNC did much better than we had anticipated, considering the national movement. And the fact that it was a presidential, or it was a midterms in a presidential, pres, in a president's first term, and I think they really feel that they can make that contrast message work. But I think there's always <laughs> a lot of nervousness among, among Democrats. I think the word that we use a lot is, is bedwetting. Um, but uh, I hate that term. I yeah, <laughs> like. Um, but I, I, I think that's just kind of their approach now. They do know that they have to figure out a way to energize voters, get excited. A lot of the things that they tried to do to get those demographic groups excited fell apart, such as forgiving student loans. And so they're just trying to find other ways like the prospect of Trump coming back into the into the Oval Office, or you know, strict abortion laws being implemented in certain states, they have to find those kind of outside motivators to get Democrats to the polls. But you know what? Don't don't sleep on that. Like right, no, and, I, huge, and I think yeah. right because if you look at the midterms, and I apologize for coughing, I've basically been talking for a month and a half straight. Um, <laughs> but but if you look at the midterms, there's two lessons that are replicable, right? When Trump and Biden aren't, aren't on the ballot. We learned two things from 2022, which is the first is that voters actually don't want candidates that, that deny election results. We saw that across the country right. in Senate, gubernatorial, and down ballot races. That's not to say election deniers didn't get elected, but by and large, in marquee races, we watched them get defeated. I think that's good news for Republicans who want to see a return to norms. The other thing, though, I think, and this is not going to shock you that I'm saying this, is you can't sleep on the idea that women feel threatened right now because they have rights being taken away from them. And that's just simply saying the fact. That's not a judgment on abortion care should or shouldn't be available. That's the Supreme Court protected something up to viability, 21 or 24 weeks, and then they said you don't have that anymore, and states have stepped in and made an entirely new patchwork. And I think that Democrats sometimes can stray from the idea or they need to get creative if they've been saying the same thing too many times. I had a, a reproductive rights advocate tell me this the other day for a story that we're probably putting out tomorrow or the next day. They think that if you just stay the course on this message, voters will resonate with the idea that Republicans are taking away freedom and are taking away the opportunity to choose and govern your body. And so I don't think that that's something that we can just kind of dismiss out of hand as an ancillary thing. I was in Ohio at the beginning of August. Three million people don't turn out for August right. special <laughs> elections on a one question ballot initiative. They just don't. And I think that those are numbers that all of us should be paying attention to and putting serious stock into because this is an issue that for 50 years went untested and we've started testing it and in all seven or eight of the instances where it's been tested free reproductive advocates have won right and if you look at the first uh, ad from the Biden campaign when he officially launched his re-election. It was on that message on freedom, yeah. not just reproductive freedom, but freedom overall. Free, um, and they feel that's a really good message for them. 
So we want to get to audience questions. So uh, get ready if you ha if you have any of those. I'll I'll offer one more um, before that. Um, Sungmin, take me into the White House decision to sort of co-opt the term Bidenomics. Now Republicans <laughs> have been attacking Bidenomics for a while, and now the, the White House is trying to turn it into a positive. Feels a little risky to me, right. but I'd love to understand their, their thinking on this. So there, I mean, so Biden, obviously, as we've discussed, has several political challenges, but one of the persistent things that we see, and actually, um, I'm writing actually up another um, poll story later this week that illustrates this, is that there does seem to be a disconnect between um, voters liking his policies and giving credit to Biden himself for it. Um, you know, this is why we're starting to see more and more um, signs all over the country. I certainly see them in D.C., and I'm sure they're um, they're around they're present around the country as well. Is that if a project was funded by the infrastructure law that um, President Biden signed into law in 2021, that you're going to see that this is from President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure law. And Bidenomics is kind of the easiest way to put the man himself onto the policies. And Bidenomics encompasses a lot of things. Um, it goes from the big COVID relief package that, um, that was signed into law in the early part of 2021 to the infrastructure law that was supported by both Republicans and Democrats and then to the Inflation Reduction Act, which I think everybody agrees was a terribly named law and does not actually convey <laughs> the purpose of the law. Or, or always or, be build back better to us. Oh gosh. <laughs> Who had to cover it for Bad a year. flashbacks. <laughs> um, which does a million things from, you know, investing in clean energy projects to, um, you know, allowing uh, the federal government to negotiate on prescription prices for Medicare for the first time. It does many, many things. They're trying to put this all, all those policies that are generally very popular on sort of this umbrella of Bidenomics. The obvious risk for that is if the economy turns south, then that is still Bidenomics. Technically, this is his economy. Um, and, uh, and that is an easy way for Republicans to say, well, that's Bidenomics. This is what's happening in, your, um, in the economy now. Um, I know the White House feels that um, if they haven't actually landed and fully avoided a recession, all the indicators are there that the economy writ large is in solid shape, which is why they feel confident kind of embracing that moniker. But I do think the challenge for the White House, which they haven't really been able to address yet, is that while these 30,000 foot numbers, these or 10,000 foot or 30,000 foot numbers with general unemployment numbers or other growth numbers are good, people themselves don't feel that way. You know, even if the rate of inflation isn't as high as it was last year, that doesn't mean prices have gone down. Eggs are still expensive. Like yeah. things are still, you know, other grocery items are still pricey. Like things still just don't seem good. So there is also the risk of having that disconnect between a really positive economic message and not recognizing that people's personal situations are still pretty crappy yeah. at this point. Yeah, it feels like for all of the chaotic things we've discussed, how that bet turns out may actually right. decide totally. who wins the election. Um, audience questions, let's get going. Um, I will, I've got one down here, but if you want to grab back there first. <coughs> tell us who you are and... Uh, Mark Osborne, I just uh, read the editorial by, what's his name, Robert Reich today about uh, how a third party candidate would uh, would uh, give the election to Trump. And he based that on, I think, the 2016 election. I was looking back at what happened with Clinton and uh, Bush in 1992, and Ross Perot seemed to give the election to Clinton. And I guess my question to you is, is Reich right, or is he blowing wind? I'll, I'll, I'll jump in there. I mean, I, I think the the fear among Democrats is that if you give some, there's a lot of people who don't like either candidate, and there are a lot of Republicans who, in particular, who don't like the Republican candidate potentially more than there are Democrats, maybe not, not don't like, who would never vote. There are more Republicans who would never vote for Donald Trump than there are Democrats who would never vote for Joe Biden. The concern being, if you give a third option, those Republicans who would never vote for Donald Trump 
would otherwise vote for Joe Biden are now going to vote for somebody else. And you're basically just taking votes. You're not necessarily taking votes away from Donald Trump. He wasn't going to get them anyway. You're taking them away from, from Joe Biden, potentially creating uh, a situation where there's enough um, uh, bleeding there that, it, that it, it, you know, we, we have, we're going to have an election that's decided in like four, yeah. five, maybe three states. And it could be, you know, tens of thousands of votes overall, and that could potentially make that's a difference. So that's the, we, it, it's academic. We don't, we don't know, but that, that I think that is a much more credible fear than it helping uh, uh, Donald Trump. That's the thing I think about too. It's like when you look at the ways that Biden was able to win in Georgia, the ways that he was able to flip Wisconsin. You're looking at these counties, and you're looking at between ten and twenty thousand votes, and it's always a question of turnout. But when you're playing with razor thin margins like that in an electoral college system, no one likes to add an extra spoiler. And I think the thing that I like to think about in 2020 and why what I'm using to get myself psyched up for a rematch that I think we all want to cover something different just for the sake of covering something different. It's not a judgment on the candidates. Yeah. But, but what I'm looking forward to is 2020 was so irreplicable in so many ways because you had extremely high turnout because a lot of states made it easier for people to right. vote because they could mail in their ballots. They had early voting. All of this expanded because of the pandemic, trying to make it easier for people in a safe fashion. I think the thing to remember is that as much as Joe Biden won, Donald Trump also got more votes in 2020 than he did after 2016, which is to say that people saw four years of the Trump administration and more of them said yes to that than they did before they knew what a Trump administration would look like. And so when you go into that where 2020 was irreplicable because it was a pandemic, and then you try to apply it to 2024, I remember Biden advisors in 2020 when we were sitting in Wilmington waiting for results to come in saying, well, you know what? This is a fascinating coalition and I also have no idea if we could ever put it together again. <laughs> and there's a lot of reasons for that. And so you introduce a third person, whoever that might be, is it Joe Manchin, is it some, whatever, right? No one wants to add the guesswork to that. Will we ever learn of their funding if it does get off the ground? Uh, oh, of... Um, third yeah, um, probably not. <laughs> uh, that or, yeah, it's an organization. I'm, I imagine it's a 501c4 and doesn't need to disclose its donors. So, <laughs> so probably. Yeah. And I, I imagine they. I, I'm not an expert on this. I, I imagine they've disclosed a number of people who have who have given to them. But yeah, they they they're not required to disclose that. Yeah, down here. So um, my question is how has the advent of small dollar don uh, donations, small dollar fundraising changed the Republican pr presidential primary process? Will we see it become a more formalized part of the process as we did with, uh, uh, with the debate qualification requirements on the number of donors? And in light of Ben Terrace's piece in Washington Post yesterday, do you think Tim Scott has a girlfriend? <laughs> I'm gonna leave that this to our Tim Scott our correspondent. <laughs> Allie over here. <laughs> you take you take small dollar donations. I'll take Tim, Tim Scott's girlfriend. Um, I think one. Uh, I am actually not a, a huge campaign finance expert, nor do I cover the issue, so I can't opine too much on it. I do think the rise of small dollar donations and how effective they have been, particularly for people like Donald Trump who can send out kind of an email missive when the clerk's office in Georgia accidentally posts a cop, like, a, like an unfinished copy of the indictment and really rally um, a really rally a, a huge part of the base to donate, you know, dollar, five dollars, twenty dollars, whatever. There is an argument to be made that kind of this aggressive like seeking after small dollar donations creates sort of even further creates this polarization. And, you, and you've kind of seen it more uh, with President Trump just because we're kind of, we're much more steeped into the Republican presidential primary politics than Democrats, obviously. But, you know, Bernie Sanders had that and effect Warren. too. Well, and Warren in 2020. And obviously we're not, they're nowhere on the same scale, but they do appeal to a more ideological part of the party than perhaps like a Joe Biden would. So I think there's a lot to be explored and just kind of the bigger, broader impact of like this hyper focus on small dollar donations and, depend and kind of their impact on the broader electorate and what candidates can succeed from that, independent of like the, all the kind of mechanical stuff like how, you know, how does it make you qualify for the debate and things like that. 
I think Tim Scott has a girlfriend. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of this piece, uh, which is very insidery, came out yesterday about the fact that Tim Scott has a girlfriend who none of us have talked to and none of us know who she is. And he says it's because he wants to keep his loved ones away from the spotlight. This is not what she signed up for. If he wins, it's what she signed up for. I think the way that Ben put it is right. It would be absolutely insane for a presidential campaign to catfish America. I'm gonna go with times are crazy, but he does have a girlfriend. And I look, she sounds great. <laughs> yeah, there's a few back there. Uh, hello, my name is Caden Foster. I'm a student here at the University of Kansas. My question is to Ali about the January 6th. We were talking about January 6th earlier. Do you think that if a candidate other than Donald Trump were to get nominated by the Republican Party, that January 6th would play more of a role in determining whether or not Joe Biden is fit to debate that topic or not? Yeah, I think that if Trump weren't a part of that conversation, I think that it, it allows it to be one step removed for whoever the Republican is that's standing in on those conversations. I mean, I, I, I would be struck if Trump somehow became not a factor, if he dropped out or whatever, how... Nikki Haley or Tim Scott, who was at the Capitol that day, right. um, or any of these other folks actually engaged with that issue when Trump is not a tangible, active, looming presence. Um, because again, I think that this is a moment that will have implications in politics forever. Um, and to me, it's like a real inflection point right. in American politics. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if he weren't the nominee, I think it would completely change the way that Biden was able to engage with it. I also think if there weren't active investigations into what Trump allegedly did on January 6th from the DOJ, Biden would also have a different interaction with this as a topic. But I think the, the politics right. of it and the not wanting it to seem like it's a political witch hunt the way that Republicans say it is, I think that's really, really potent in this too. There's one up here, two up here. Is Kamala Harris a plus or a minus? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I will make the shameless plug that I did spend a lot of time in my book about this because I think that there's a real conversation to be had about how effective Kamala Harris has been as a vice president. But I also think that a lot of the idea of her ineffectiveness, because we all know that there's a lot of hand-wringing over the role that the vice president plays and how well she plays it. First of all, you don't just wake up one day and roll out of bed and accidentally become vice president. It requires skill and talent and, and brilliance, and she has all of those things. And also, I think that it's hard to look at her and not project that we just had higher expectations for what someone who looks like her and sounds like her would do with an office that no one who looks like her and sounds like her has ever had before. You look at Mike Pence, you look at Al Gore, you look at Joe Biden, the job of vice president is to ride the coattails of the president, amplify the message of the president, certainly don't overshadow the president. Everyone who I talked to, whoever worked in a vice presidential office said that is the literal job. And so when you have someone who is trailblazing and history making, you expect them to come in and make it look and sound different. When they don't do that, there's something that's a little disappointing about that. But we also shouldn't want her to go in and remake the job of vice president because that's not the job that she's there to do. Do I think that some of the answers that we see her give sometimes are a little ham-handed and off. Yes. Is she also the running mate to a guy who was known for his gaffes? Absolutely. <laughs> well said. Right here. There is a crowded field of men running for president on the Republican ticket. There also seem to be a growing field of female candidates that seem to be running for vice president, like governors and elected officials. Do you think it's important that Trump select a female vice presidential candidate? I think the days of two straight white men being on the ticket just themselves are over. That might be me being an optimist, but it also might be me looking at the fact that I think one of the things we saw out of the Kamala Harris elevation was a real engagement from communities of color who may not have been as excited to vote for Joe Biden and then were. We saw it in fundraising dollars. Vice presidents don't make presidents. We all know it's a matter of a point or two, um, and that's us being generous. But at the same time, I think that 
you have to look seriously at the fact that Republicans have done a much better job in recent years at putting people in the pipeline who are experienced, who have different lived experiences, and can viably run. I mean, look at the number of female governors that you have across the country. You have Kristi Noem, you have Sarah Huckabee Sanders, uh, you have in this field, Nikki Haley, I would not argue that she's running for vice president. I actually think she wants to be president, but we're gonna get to a veep stakes eventually. I think it's good news. Are you picking up anybody as a, a front runner at this point? Oh, I mean, if we're assuming it's Trump, I mean, I, I've long held the notion, I think, that I could see it being Christy Nome, um, in part because if you remember the Trump years, right. they hewed very closely together. She's someone who's close with his political orbit. I, I could also make a case for Sarah Huckabee Sanders, someone who has been a spokesperson for Trump and could be that again as a vice president. She's an executive. I don't know. Those are my dark horses if I had to pick a woman, but yeah. we'll get there when we get there. Right. You don't like my Sarah Huckabee Sanders choice? No, it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go again? Sure. Charlie Crabtree. What are your feelings about the 14th Amendment? I see some of the states, uh, a couple of them anyway, are doing something like putting it on the ballot for a vote. If that happens and it votes no, does that mean Trump does not get to be on that state's ballot? And if so, how many states would it take to do that before Trump would give up? Well, I think it's most likely to take place in states that Donald Trump's probably not gonna win anyway. Um, I think it's a really bad idea to mess with um, for a number of reasons. Uh, one, I think you have to have some level of process to determine that you've met that threshold and whether legal or not. But to the, to the bigger question, that would be an absolute turnout machine for Donald Trump and his supporters. That would set Republicans on fire. And they, you know, you, all the things of victimhood that, that Donald Trump plays now, I think that would, you know, you crank that up times 10. So I, I think it would be really short-sighted, um, and uh, I, I don't take it very seriously as a, as a real threat to him, it, like, practically, but I also think just having this conversation, um, they would love that. They would love to get people fired up about that kind of thing. Who's next? All the way in the back. Uh, hello, I'm John. I'm a student here at the University of Kansas. So I guess my, my question is, why is Joe Biden focusing on Bidenomics? Earlier in your uh, talk, you mentioned that issues that have been received more, let's call it pleasantly by voters, say abortion rights or uh, portrayals of, say, uh, Republicans as having segments that are more extremist than most voters would prefer have resonated harder with moderates and the traditional Democratic base. So why is Joe Biden focusing on an issue that's more mixed and amplifying it rather than focusing on issues that might be more positively received by both traditional Democratic voters and also moderate and swing voters? I think it's a huge focus for them because Traditionally, um, you know, with every presidential election, it, traditionally it is going to be the economy that um, helps determine whether a president is reelected or not. And so this is, it, it's going to, and how you deal with the economy is a big question to, to any president who faces reelection. So they know that they have to like, they have to find like a way to, um, to approach it. They are also, I mean, also it just, they are legit, legitimately proud of their accomplishments and they want to really focus on that and make sure that what people eventually see someday happening in their communities, happening to their pocketbooks, that can be connected to Democrats and connected to uh, President Biden himself. So that's kind of that, and they feel that that is perhaps a more kind of broadly resonating message. Um, but they're finding other ways to focus on the other issues that you've discussed, such as abortion. Um, I do think on abortion, though, I will say that President Biden has never been personally comfortable with the issue. He is, um, you know, he is a, a Catholic, older, white male. This is, he had supported actually in his years as senator much very uh, strict um, 
of you know, legislative measures that would ban federal funding for abortion. He had to eventually reverse his position on that during the <coughs> 2020 campaign. It's just never an issue that he's going to be comfortable with. I think that's obviously that's an issue where Harris, um, as the vice president, who doesn't want to overshadow the president but can step in if the president can't do a certain something, that's where she that's where the White House feels she really has shined after a year or so of kind of struggling in public on other issues such as immigration. So they find they find different ways of dealing with different approaches kind of uh, with the strengths and potential weaknesses that they have. It's really interesting because I, I, I've often thought that the White House would talk or the president would talk a lot more about abortion given what we just saw in the midterms. The State of the Union this year, he talked for like 30 seconds about it and right. moved and right along. What's so stunning, and reproductive advocates will point this out, he doesn't actually say the word abortion. Right. Either. It's clear that he is the most, you know, reluctant warrior for this moment that is the culmination of both the right and the left's work uh, to both protect or restrict abortion access. It's mm -hmm. really a stunning mm -hmm. historical figure. Got a few more minutes. Um, any <clears throat> questions from the audience? Oh, right there. Oh, I'm, I'm, my name is Scott Anderson. This is more of an ob observation than a question. Um, and this conversation kind of confirms my belief, and it really has to do with the media. And it appears to me that media is always chasing, you know, the hot issue. Like, for instance, in this uh, conversation, he talked about. Hunter Biden and the uh, impeachment thing, which is really, that's nonsense. That's really unimportant in terms of this country. But then at the same time, um, January 6th, okay, we said that's a big deal, but then we don't really talk about the ongoing uh, things that Republicans are doing to uh, suppress voter rights and um, things like that, which really will have an impact on this country. And really, uh, Kansas is a good example of that and the fact that you know, we had three representatives and one senator who voted against, you know, certifying the vote. Yeah. And I think that's something that needs to be impressed on people, the fact that Republicans are still out there attacking our democracy. And, you know, I, I think there's a real risk if the Republicans get control back. I mean, our democracy is done. Well, maybe why don't we conclude it with, with, with this, if I could ask kind of each of you, what do you think maybe the one, if you were to pick one dynamic or issue that will ultimately decide who wins the White House in, in 2024, what do you think that would be? What, what, is the, what is the big issue that ultimately you think will um, define? I know there's, some, as we've discovered, there's a lot going on. There's a lot more that will probably happen that we haven't um, come across yet. But what do you think ultimately will, will turn this election? That's tough. I think I have my answer. Go for it. It's not going to be shocking. Um, women. Yeah. Uh, because, and I say that not just because it's like, you know, my focus. I say that because if you look at the ways that Biden and Democrats were actually able to flip key states, it's because of the work that they were able to do with white suburban women. And that's a, that's a big part of this, this question mark of is the coalition something they can replicate? And... You know, we'll see. I think the other thing that I like to remind people of, as someone who, you know, is on cable and is subjected to the conversations that our hosts and our anchors and our networks want to have, is, you know, we can all walk and chew gum at the same time. And I think you're right that there are issues that don't get talked about enough. And we all really try to highlight things that are not in the center of the conversation. I'm working on a veterans piece that'll air soon on on MSNBC, you know, we're all trying to do things on policy, but what these lawmakers are doing is important as well. And following <clears throat> impeachment and the inquiry, I think, is important because it allows us to show what's real, what's evidence, what's just an allegation. And, you know, I think holding space for all of that is something we all try to do. So for my one issue, um, it's hard to pick like a policy issue, but I would say kind of the one word or two words would be anger or fear. Mm -hmm. I think we've seen, and that could encompass a lot of things. It could be anger over attempts to even further restrict abortion, which we've already seen in states all over the country, including here in Kansas. It's the fear or the anger of Trump being back in the White House. I think what we, a general rule that we've seen, particularly in the last um, several elections, is that 
anger and fear is an incredible motivator, uh, whether depending on what the issue is, but is an incredible motivator. And we were talking about this a little earlier. I'm not, and maybe you guys can, you guys, if you feel differently, can correct me in the audience if I'm wrong. I'm not sure how many voters go out um, and vote for someone based on the past, which is why I'm not quite sure how ultimately effective the end of the day the Biden administration's efforts on kind of tying his legislative accomplishments to his reelection will really be decisive at the end of the day. Again, please correct me if you disagree, but I think much more effective would be the motivator of fear and anger of getting out there. So whether that encompasses the you know democracy and voting access and, or abortion, all of that, I think that will really be what, for now, what the election is kind of based on. And I also do, and I, I completely agree with a lot of what you said. I will say at the AP <coughs> that we are really trying to invest in more democracy coverage on the ground, looking at efforts on the local level to restrict voting access or efforts, you know, efforts that we don't see at the national level uh, of on all of those issues. Um, so I do think you see that newsrooms are making an effort if they have the resources. I think that's the tough thing if they have the resources because we know this is a tough time for the industry and we're just doing the best with what we have. Great. What's your issue? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not answering. No, I'm you just, have I'm to. Just asking, <laughs> I'm just you asking. don't have to tell me Sarah Huckabee Sanders is an interesting <laughs> choice and not answer this question. Um, I want to thank everybody uh, for being here tonight. This was a lot of fun. Um, obviously, some really smart people up here. So I um, want to thank you all for participating. I want to thank the Dole Institute for having us. It's always a, a pleasure to be here. Um, and I uh, hope to see you again around here before too long. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.